if you like betting on golf. But everyone that you back misses the cut, get some experts involved. With all the stats and the tips and so much more, cause it's the golf betting system, the golf betting system is the golf betting system. Greetings and welcome to the Golf Betting System Podcast 185. Barry O'Hanrahan and Paul Williams join me, Steve Bamford, to discuss this week's PGA and European Tour action, namely the Shriners Children's Open and the Open de Spagna. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning, chaps. Morning, guys. This podcast is for listeners of 18 and above. Please be gamble aware. You can visit begambleaware.org for more information. And of course, please bet responsibly. Visit our world-famous golf betting system website with our in-depth betting previews, masses of tournament statistics, and our predictor models all available completely free of charge with no paywall. Please subscribe to this podcast and drive the popularity of the show. We're available on social media, on Twitter. Paul's at, at Golf Betting. I'm at Bamford Golf, and Barry is at A Good Talk Golf. You can join our golf betting system Facebook group. The link is available in the description box. Plus... Look out for the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel where I present the Golf Betting Show every week. Please subscribe and like the shows. Now, you guys as listeners power this podcast, so we need your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, whatever you call it. As ever, for those of you who leave a review, I will read them out at the start of a future show. Now, as you guys know, these reviews are very, very important just to help spread the word and uh, the amount of reviews that you get uh, gives you more clarity in terms of the visibility you get on recommended podcasts. That's why we need you to support the show. Now, we've got a great review here. This is the review. We've been, we've been waiting for this for a couple of weeks, haven't we, Paul? It's Harry from Wimbledon. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. The best golf podcast five stars. This review is long overdue, but prompted by my meeting Steve and Paul by chance at Virginia Water Railway Station after Friday's play at Wentworth. After explaining that I'd been an avid listener of the golf podcast for several years, it had been a life saver during lockdown. They invited me to join them on the journey back to London. I really enjoyed the golf chat and felt like a guest on the podcast, exclamation mark. Two terrific guys and so knowledgeable. All that was missing was the wonderful Barry, whose dry humour and sometimes left-field approach to golf betting is so refreshing. Follow these guys on a regular basis, and you'll have a lot of fun, as well as some big returns. Thanks for enhancing my enjoyment of our great sport. From Harry from Wimbledon. There you go. What a lovely five-star review that is, chaps. Yeah, brilliant, isn't it? And, and thanks, Harry, for taking the time to write that. And it was um, it was great to meet you, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago. It was a, a great chat we had on the on the train on the way back into into London, and uh, always good to uh, to chew the fat with uh, with like-minded people. So uh, fantastic, yeah. and, and thanks for that. That's a five-star review you... and a half. Were you saying, Barry, you were playing around of golf the other day and someone came up to you and said, are you Barry off the podcast? Yeah, I was playing up in um, Rasapana, playing Sandy Hills, um, and was a friend was a friend of the uh, group that we were playing in, um, was up there playing, and going to be playing a couple of days later with some mates, so he jumped up a day early to play with us, Neville, and um, the, the the voice was enough to, for him to make the connection, and uh, so we had a chat about the show, and and golf betting in general, and uh, and how difficult Sandy Hills was in um, in windy conditions. So uh, just uh, to give a shout out to Neville, um, it was a pleasure to play with you. I hope to tee it up again soon. So a little community that we we continue <laughs> to build, eh? Yeah, fame precedes you guys. Now I said to you last week, Paul, that I was glad that you um, kept your uh, Joachim Lagergren on your side and it worked out nice didn't it a full each way payout last week 150 to 1 yeah 125 it was when he went oh was it 125 went to press Sorry. but yes he was um, 
yes, it was a nice, uh, nice return. He had his chances as well, didn't he? The putter was on fire for the first, uh, well, towards the back end of the uh, the front nine on Sunday, and I was getting rather excited, but he did miss uh, miss a few tiddlers, which uh, could have made all the difference. I think there were three inside eight feet or so on Sunday that had he made, um, it could have been a completely different story, but. I guess for a 125 to one shot, you can't really grumble at getting a, uh, you know, what was no. in the end, it wasn't a uh, kind of skinnier teeth place. He was, uh, he was solidly in second spot and uh, we were just hoping that Danny Willett made a, made a mistake coming down the stretch to, to let him in, but uh, it didn't happen. Well, it's not like it's checking the lead. Every time I kept checking the leaderboard, he'd make a bogey. So he gave up. <laughs> and then he started playing nicely. Yeah, oh, there, was, there was some really nice putts he made in there. But yeah, I, yeah, at the end of the day, he'd have had to have shot eight under, nine under to win outright on Sunday, which is a, it's a tough ask, isn't it, on a Sunday regardless, um, particularly when you've got a, a, a Masters champion ahead of you and uh, a guy who seemingly can find his form in these bigger events from absolutely nothing. And uh, we'll walk away with another big title. If you look at his last four wins, Danny, will it? He won the Masters, the DP World Tour Championship, the BMW PGA Championship, and then last week the Dunhill Links, and nothing else. No tiny little event in between. It's just. Um... It's not even a build up of form in the main, <laughs> is there? He just goes out and wins them. He came in with form of miscut, miscut, seventy-one missed cut, and. As you said um, a, a few few minutes ago before we started recording. We followed him at Wentworth, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, we, we, we followed him around for a bit at Wentworth to see how he was He was never on. in the fairway. He was, he was really poor. But you, again, you listen to his interviews and it's no different to when he's won some of those other ones that I've just mentioned, um, yeah, maybe the Masters excluded, where he said, look, you know, um, when I'm good, I'm really, really good. But there's a lot of bad stuff in between. And um, when it all just clicks, where you go. I mean, 100 to 1 that was last week for Danny Willett. If you'd have been able to look past the incoming form and just say, well, you know, Danny Willett's a capable winner of a, you know, of big golf tournaments on the European and, and worldwide stage. And if you'd have taken a chance at 100, you'd have been rewarded in spades. Before the Masters, he also in 2016 won the Amiga Dubai Desert Classic. Did, so yeah. as you say, that's, that's five rather large tournaments right there. Yeah. yeah. Mm. He, so, he doesn't so, do Kazoo Open, does he? How'd you call him that? Uh, it's a, yeah, I mean, it's a serious resume, isn't it? And it's mm. just, it's hard to, because he doesn't pop up that regularly, I suppose we kind of write him off a bit, or it's hard to give credence to the fact that he's had so, such a, it's a ridiculously good career. Mm. Um, and, and so, but I suppose that's, he's got the, the high variance career where he goes and grabs wins and then he disappears with a whole bunch of missed cuts and, so do you want would you prefer that or would you prefer the consistent top 20s making cuts every week yeah I, 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 you're going to want the wins aren't you i mean there's the high, the highs and the lows he's a kind of kevin nar doesn't win the bigger tournaments but kevin nar's the other one another one isn't he garbage 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 win yeah garbage garbage I got garbage the analogy win. yeah but yeah, yeah. but uh, will it will it just wins us a different level of tournament. Yeah, he to, does. No. Yeah, you know, you, you get your Jim Hermans who come along and just uh, win at will every, mm. you know, now and again. But they aren't, you know, they're, they're not the Masters. They're not the the, the BMW Championship or PGA Championship. They're not flagship events or you know high no. ranking events on the respective tour. Patrick either. Reed like maybe as well. We've always said Patrick Reed's a danger. Mm. 50, 55, 66 to one. That's where Reed does most of his winning. Yeah, and they're big tournaments. Yeah, mm. yeah. But, there's, you know, even if, even if you knew, you, knew, you know, we all know all this. We all look at it. We all understand that he can win these tournaments. It's still difficult to pull the trigger when you stand there and stare at a form sheet coming into an event and, you know, having eyeballed the performances as well and think, well, you know, mm. even at 100 to 1, do I pull the trigger here with a Danny Willett? And, yeah. Well, what do you write? All you can basically say is, this is an auto bet. Danny yeah. Willett wins big tournaments. Here's a list. I think he might win this one. Yeah, there you go. 100 to 1. And then yeah. like three months later, another big tournament, you just sort of yeah. cut, paste, Danny Willett. It's almost that kind of bet. Because yeah. you won't see anything in the build-up that 
in any way, shape, or form tells you that he's about to do what he does. Was it, would I be correct in saying the last one he t- kind of telegraphed was the Masters, where he had some form was yeah, shown Dubai before one, going yeah. in. Dubai yeah, in yeah. February, yeah, and he yeah, won the Masters yeah. in April, yeah. But other than that, you know, it's, it's a strange one. Well, his, last, yeah. his last three wins are this time of year, you know, November, September, end of September and October. So, I mean, there, there's a little biorhythm for, yeah. as you like to point out as well, That's Steve. True. So maybe, maybe Danny Willett in the autumn, big event. And and that's all we can do with it. Make yeah. a note. Yeah. He'll have to join my post its on the wall here. <laughs> but you um, remember yeah. when he you remember when he won the um, BMW PGA Championship? It, he had been well backed, well fancied the week before at um, yeah. at Crans mm-hmm. uh, and, and again, for, quite rightly, and he missed the cut. He was he was awful, and you know everyone was like, oh, okay, full letdown. He's going into a bigger bigger tournament this week. Everyone looks the other way, and um, it just pops up and wins. Infuriating, unless you are an, an avid Danny Willett fan who um, backs him blindly, and uh, you'll, you'll be you'll be in clover. Anyway, anyway, it was interesting to see most of the um, defeated European team actually had a good tournament, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, mm. relative terms. Fleetwood yeah. was up there. Fat Hatton was right near the top of the lead, but he was at the top of the leaderboard for a long period of time, wasn't he, Hatton? Mm. Yeah, Lowry was up there as well. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. There was no no kind of tools down, complete disasters, was there? It was uh, there, there, there was some effort put in. And again, I think that just shows you the gulf between the top tier guys and the kind of the run of the mill uh, European tour players who. Yeah, best will in the world. If the other players are on their game, they're going to struggle to get anywhere near them, really. And you know, a fair play to Lagergren because that was a, a strong performance against a, a number of um, far more fancied and far more elevated players in terms of the golfing hierarchy. But yeah, he's, he's one. It, 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 it's, it's relatively easy to spot Lagergren. You put him on a, a coastal style track, um, a big price, and just uh, just take your chance with him. Yeah, you actually showed some. Um, it's holding on to these players after they do you the week or outing before, and then when they miss the cut, and you're like, oh, "I've had enough of him." And you did well there to to actually say, "No, he's he's logically correct," and uh, you got your rewards on that one. Um, I was kicking myself because I had a couple of weeks to build up to the Sanders and Farms because they actually had a field. Field. They were one of the tournaments that let you saw the field before Friday cut off. So I knew he was playing. And the name that instantly jumped to me as soon as I saw the first field was Sam Burns. And when those first prices came out Monday and he was 16 to 1, I was just grabbing my head. You know, it's like, oh, I can't. Not 16 to 1. So then they often say, don't they, it's like the, the first impulse that comes into your mind should be the one that you go with. So yeah, Sam Burns won that sixteen to one. Very, that's two wins now in the last. He won the Valspar, didn't he? Back in May, I think it was. Precocious talent. His numbers last week at the Sanderson Farms were absolutely mad. He was number one for strokes gained off the tee. He grown, he gained one and a half strokes per round. His approach play was ranked second. He gained over two strokes on the field per round in with his approach play. And total T to green or strokes gained ball stroke, uh, yeah, T to green, 3.7 strokes gained per round. And he actually, and I did say this last week, you can win this with a negative strokes gained putting split, the Sanderson Farms. He did. He was losing half a stroke around on the greens. Shot 22 under. That's amazing. But yes, I think Sanderson Farms again, Country Club of Jackson. That, that what's gone, going to go down in my notebook is it is Bomber City. It really is. Burns was seventeenth for driving distance. Nick Watney twentieth. Cameron Young tied for second. He was third for driving distance, three twenty seven off the tee. So you need a particularly good week from someone that isn't a bomber to get close. We have seen it there, Ryan Armour and the likes. Um, I had CT Pan just miss the frame. I think he was one shot off an each way place. And I had Siwoo Kim. Now, Siwoo Kim was interesting. He was actually tied for the lead Friday morning. I think he got uh, 10 under. I was thinking, oh, this is nice. 
And then when I looked next, he bogeyed two on the back nine and was actually finished the day on tw- in 27th spot. So yeah, from the time for the lead, he was 27th. And from that point, you just could see from the history of the tournament, you've got to be right on the pace. And then he, he had an absolutely fantastic weekend and got a sliver of each way return for me at um, 30 to 1. But when, Kim's playing some really nice golf at the yeah, moment, Steve yeah. Kim. When you when you're getting you know, you need to be in the low twenties under par to be to be getting right in the mix. You can't afford You can't have a day off, can you? You've no. you've either you could if if you're gonna have a if you're gonna have a one under day or a level par day, you've got to shoot literally on a tournament like that at least a sixty one, sixty two another day yeah. to catch up the lost ground. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's foot not, to the floor stuff, isn't it? If it's not straight sixty five, sixty sixes, you've got to have that mad low round in there, haven't you? Um, you mentioned yeah. Cameron Young. I had a, an email from uh, Nikki M, who, um, who converses with me now and again on stuff, and uh, he'd, uh, he'd he'd back Lagergren, which um, he just popped me a note to say uh, to say how pleased he was with that. But he also told me about a treble that he would placed, um, where he had Cameron Young uh, at four hundred to one, Lagergren and Maria Fassi at two hundred and fifty to one. All three of them placed in a treble over the weekend. Wow! Um, which I haven't worked out the odds, but that must have been. Uh, Absolutely ginormous. So, uh, so well done, Nikki. That's a great, great uh, treble to to land. Um, more of those, please, everybody. That's exactly what we want to see. Did you say, Barry, that 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 guy that you can't pronounce the name of, and nor can I? He won at a. Did he want win on the Challenge Tour last week as well? Hella Kilda, yeah. Um, I did not um, think about going down a tour level when I didn't see him in the field last week, so that's my bad. But yeah, so yeah. I, I take solace in it. I think Paul said he was going off at twenty-five to one. Twenty-five, so yeah, yeah. That may have deterred me a bit, although trying to not be price proud. Um, but at the same time, the fact that I made the pick and then very close afterwards, he you know he goes and wins. Um, that um, I take a little bit of comfort in that that maybe the the head and the picks are somewhere synchronizing up to grab a winner. Fingers crossed. I think we've got another birdie shoot this week, guys. The Shriners Children's Open. Off the they come thick and fast. They they come thick and fast. These birdie parties, don't they? Now on the on the PJ Tour. Yeah. Saying yeah, yeah. that, we've got the CJ Cup next week, which is being played at the Summit Club. Uh, in Las Vegas, uh, and then the tour, another short field seventy-eight man event, the Zozo, which is going back to Japan. Oh, I okay. think they are they are actually going out to Japan this time. I believe so. Yes. Mm-hmm. So we've got two those two short field loaded events the next two weeks coming up. And to be fair, the Shriners Open isn't that bad this week. We're used to seeing Deshambo and Cantlay here. Uh, we've had Jason Day in the past, but. It's slightly down on quality, but any field that's got Hovland, Kepka, Anser, Scheffler, Burns, Simpson, Nah, Matsuama, Louis Ustayers, and Will Zalatoris, Sanjay M, Harry English, Harris English, and Corey Connors in the bad field. You can also throw in there Patrick Reed, Paul Casey, Siwoo Kim. So it's a decent, decent tournament. These, I don't know what it is, but these players love a trip to Las Vegas. What can you do, eh? Shocking! It is shocking. I don't know what they get up to when they're not playing, but um, I'm sure they're all very professional about it. Yeah, I'm sure they're taking a cabaret or something, don't they? <laughs> Clearly, you've got Butch Harmon's um, ranch and, and training centre out here as well, and, and a lot of the um, professionals use uh, Las Vegas as a base. Uh, Maverick McNeely lives in, in, in Las Vegas. Uh, Ryan Moore. Colin Morikawa, who doesn't play this week, I guarantee you he plays next week. Kevin Nahr, Scott Piercy, Nick Watney, who's coming off a second. They're all Las Vegas residents. Um, and, you know, you've got the likes of Ricky Fowler, who's over here a lot, uh, with Birch and Jimmy Walker and, and the likes. There's lots and lots of local links to Las, to Las Vegas. Um, the golf course itself, I mean, we should all be okay with this. We, go, we come here every year. TPC Summerlin. Uh, what are we looking at with Summerlin? We are looking at a short course. It's 7,255 yards at altitude. It's a par 71. 
It's clearly a desert golf course. There's lots of um, rocks, cactuses, um, geckos, lizards. There's all manner of stuff off the fairway. For the holes, for the 18 holes feature water hazards. Fairways of Bermuda grass, rough is Bermuda grass, two and a quarter inches this year it's quoted as. The greens are large, 7,400 square feet. They feature A1, A4 bent grass greens. So Bermuda grass, rough and fairways, bent grass greens. The only other course, Steve Agronomy Bamford here, the only other course that features that mix on the PGA Tour is Colonial Country Club. And if you go off um, tournament titles, that's the Charles Swab Challenge as is. And it's interesting with Colonial. Um, Laird, who won here last year at 225-20, he's got a couple of te- t- top tens at Colonial. Bryson DeChambeau's finished third there in the past. Um, Rod Pampling, who won this ages ago, has got a second, a third and a sixth there. So there's quite a lot of crossover with Colonial. Kevin Nahr, of course, has won this twice and won at Colonial as well. So... If you're looking for a correlating golf course, I don't think a Colonial Country Club is a bad one. There are quite a few. Um, what have you got to do here? Well, just the 2020, so last season, this shot, this golf course played at 68.34 strokes on average per day, which was over two and a half strokes under par for the field. It was the third easiest golf course on the whole of the PGA Tour last season. So it's fairly obvious what we've got to do. We've got to shoot lights out this week. 2016 saw an opening round 11 under 60 from eventual champion Rod Pampling, plus minus 10, 61s from Francesco Molinari and Ches Arrivi. Across the last three renewals, we've also seen Lucas Glover. Lucas Glover has got a great course record here. Kevin Nahr, and Matthew Wolf all shoot 61s, 10 under par. So this course is very, very gettable. I mean, it's the perfect, it's the perfect storm, really, isn't it? Wide fairways, they're 33 yards at 300 yards carry, which is four yards wider than Jackson last week, and eight yards wider than Silverado for the 40 net. So wide fairways, a short course at altitude, and they always make sure the Nevada fire tenders are here to make sure those greens are nice and receptive. Yeah. Although all, all of the players will say, oh, it's, it's really, the, oh, it's so fast. The, the greens are very fast <laughs> and they're shooting like 21 under par. Yeah, it's an odd one, isn't it? Because uh, going through the list of names you read through, you, know, <laughs> you, you included someone like a Lucas Glover in any of the conversation. And when you're talking about shooting that deep or scoring that deep, um, and likening the types of uh, Lucas Glover to the uh, to the event, then it, it creates a bit of kind of indecision, I think, because you're thinking, well, oh, on, on one hand, you've got, you know, you want someone who's rattling off birdie after birdie, yet you've got all of these kind of, I don't know, more ball-striking, um, yeah, tee to green men who um, seem, to have, uh, seem to have managed to find a way to get over the line here over the last few years. The cut line here last year was seven under par. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. seven under to make the cut. Yeah. You, you, you can't. You, you can't be. You can't be a typical Lucas Glover missing everything inside six feet if you're going to get to that kind of number, are you? Dude, let's compute that. So there's, you know, I've shot sixty-eight Thursday, sixty-eight Friday. I'm six under par. Oh, I'm playing all right here. Yeah. Missed the cut. Just madness. But yeah, I agree, Paul. It's one of those tournaments. Laird, ball striker. DeChambeau, you know, outrageous. And this is DeChambeau 2019. It's, it, he was a different animal back then. He, he wasn't all guns blazing. He, he was a nice classical golf course player then. Not long enough, but actually used to hit tons of fairways. Cantlay in 17. He won in a, a weird year where it was blowing hard. I was on Cantley that year at 21. Pampling. And then you get... Weird results as well, like Smiley Kaufman and Kevin Nahr. So this is it. It's one of those tournaments where you've either got plodders who can prosper, who can't putt, 
yeah? Or someone with a red hot putter that actually's garden backs onto the golf course, Kevin Nahr. <laughs> yeah, he wins when he's, he's like 11, he's gaining 11 strokes on the field with a putter. Yeah. It's, it's one of those tournaments where you sit there with a field of 140, well, I don't know what it is, 152 this week. Uh, and you just yeah, think, yeah, how can I make any sense of this whatsoever? <clears throat> Led, this was also a statistic that I thought was interesting. Led was 20th for strokes game putting. DeChambeau 45th. Cantley 32nd. And Pampling 39th. So they're absolutely nowhere near the top of the field the week they won. And then, of course, Kevin Nahr. Kevin Nahr, when he won... He was 3.5 strokes putting positive each round. Complete and utter extremes. I do think, though, that this is a course, there's a couple of things that I do focus down on. I think this is a golf course where you've got to hit tons and tons of fairways. So if you're if you're one of these prestigious length bombers that doesn't care about hitting fairways, you're not going to do very well around here. So that's one thing I think is an important, and it's a consistent number. I mean, if I go back 2010 through 2010, Jonathan Bird in 2010, driving distance, this is the average skill sets of the winners across that time period. Driving distance 16th, driving accuracy, sorry, that driving distance number is wrong. It should actually read 27th. I need to change that. Uh, driving distance 27th in the field, driving accuracy 11th. And you don't see that very often on the PJ Tour. And when you read a lot of the comments, they're all saying, well, I can't shoot 23 under par when I'm in the rough and getting fly allies every second hole. Greens and reg 15th, a scrambling 23rd, putting average 7th. There's a surprise. You've got to have a good putting week. But that doesn't translate to strokes gain. So what it's saying effectively is you've got to create loads of good birdie chances that aren't overly long. You know, you're... A great week from a five to ten feet. Uh, strokes gained off the tee. I'm running this 2015 through 2020. So Smiley Kaufman through Laird, looking at the skill set averages. Strokes gained off the tee, the average of the winners 20th. Approach play 15th. Around the green 31st. Strokes gained tee to green 13th. And strokes gained putting. There you go, 24th. 24th in the field. And I, I gave you the list of those winners. Even even the year Kevin Nahr won, he won in a playoff from Patrick Cantlay, yeah? Uh, they both shot 23 under par. Uh, Cant- Kevin Nahr was first for strokes going putting. There's a surprise. Patrick Cantlay was 41st for strokes going putting. So I'm more of the ilk of kind of going for, for players that I think... Um, can hit the prerequisite amount of fairways. And I love play. I don't know. Uh, just players, I think, that are... A, I've gone for a slight mix. I've, I've gone for four this week. Um, it's just... A, I, I think even the bookmakers are struggling to pick the favourite. It's one of those fields where they've lumped them all. You know, 20 to 25 to 1 is just crazy, really. Hovland, Kepka, Anser, Scheffler. Sam Burns is now shorter in price with most firms than Webb Simpson and the Masters champion Hideki Matsuama and Kevin Nahr. Uh, and then you've got, yeah, 28 to 1. Simpson, Nahr, Matsuama, Oosthuizen, Will Zalatoris, 25s to 30s, Sung Jm at 33s. Sung Jm never grows in price, does he? It always seems to be twenty five to thirty three to one. He, he has he has to be one of the worst bets on tour. That, he's like, terrible, isn't he? Al- almost like Tony Fina, just always in that kind of zone of odds and just not even delivering places that regularly. He doesn't miss cuts. He just finishes like fifteenth yeah. every week. Yeah, yeah, devastating. Just... Harris English at thirty threes, Corey Connors at thirty fives, and Patrick Reed forty to one. I mean, Reed is actually a good value price this week with Paul Casey. So there you go. So you've got between twenty and forty to one. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen players, fifteen players. Sorry. 
It's just that uh, I don't think anyone's really got a clue who's going to win this. <laughs> it has to be said. Here are the ones that I've gone for. Um, I've gone for Hideki Matsuama. 28 to 1 with William Hill, 8 places. You don't buy a rhythms, you said, Baron. Mm-hmm. Hideki Matsuama has one win and 11, yes, 11 top 10 finishes in October and November on the PGA Tour. That's since 2013. And those finishes have come across China, Japan, Malaysia, South Korea, California, Nevada, and Texas. He just seems it's, to play well at this time of year, Matsuama. It's not geographically tied, it's just, that's it. The, yes, uh, there might be something in that as well, because apart from Texas, which was Houston last year, and that was the week before the Masters, if you remember, because Dustin Johnson finished second behind Carlos Ortiz and then won the week after the Green Jacket. Matsuama was second in that. But across all of those other golf courses, in the main, apart from Malaysia, which is Paspalum, they're all bent grass greens. And as we know with Hideki, he is a bent grass green kind of guy. Three of his six PGA Tour wins have come on pure bent grass greens, and two of the others have come on Bermuda grass, overseeded with bent grass. And both of those came in the desert in Phoenix. And actually, I'm looking at Laird. He's got a great record at TPC Scottsdale. DeChambeau's got a top five there. Rod Pampling had finished 8th and 12th in Phoenix. Webb Simpson's won this in 2013. We know that Simpson's a winner at Scottsdale, and he's finished second and a number of top tens. Ryan Moore's got a great record there. Kevin Nars played well in Phoenix. So I love that link to Scottsdale. I really like it. And I just thought 28 to 1 for the reigning Masters champion, coming off a sixth place, a very under the radar sixth place finish in uh, California for the Fortinet. I thought that was half decent price. So yeah, I'm on Matsuama. I mean, if we're looking for team no putt this week, Matsuama's pretty damn positive, isn't he? The bloke cannot putt. But on bent grass, pure bent grass, if he can, if he can putt at if he can gain a stroke on the greens, if he play can play as well from tee to green, which he did in California a few weeks ago, um, he was 17th off the tee, 10th for approach and 3rd for tee to green at Silverado a fortnight ago. So if he can just putt, just make a few putts, Hideki, and you'll be all right. 28 to 1. So I'm on, I'm on Hideki. You remember that purple patch he had a few years ago where he won like six events or something worldwide yep. in the space of, I don't know, three or four months? Yep, the yep, putter yep. was absolutely on fire for that stretch. It's mm-hmm. odd how he kind of waxes and wanes with that, uh, with the flat stick. But, uh, but yeah, if he ever found it again for any, you know, t- period of, consistent period of time, he'd be devastating, wouldn't he? Yeah. He would be devastating. So yeah, Matt Suama for me. I, I don't know, I just think he see once he once he got that green jacket, it was such a huge, huge deal. It was huge for him, it was huge for Japan, huge for Asian golf. Almost kind of stepping back from that was always gonna happen. But there's just been signs, aren't there? He finished I think he was second at the WGC, the one at St. Jude. Yeah, you know, he's he's just percolating again. He seems to have got over the green jacket. Things have calmed down, and it, with with um, a, a, a South Korean sponsored event next week in Las Vegas, and then of course the trip back to Japan, you would have thought that's really focusing his mind to produce his best stuff. So I'm just hoping that he actually finds a putter this week. But with Matsuama, you might find he just misses the cut. You you can never be sure. Um, my other my other selection towards the top of the betting is Matthew Wolf, and again this one goes out with a complete warning because every time I back Wolf, he's an <laughs> absolute walking disaster. However, I've got forty five to one, two points each way with Bet Fred because Wolf was second here last year. 
And I just liked the way he played last week. First two were, he, first two rounds he wasn't great, made the cut. And then from that point on, he was driving the ball beautifully. His approach play was very, very positive for rounds three and four at the um, Sanderson Farms. And when you look at Wolf and when you look at his results, bear in mind this, um, he does live in Florida, I believe. Um, he just, he's, he's done nothing so far on Bermuda grass greens. Everything he's done, is either bent grass or a mix of bent and power. So I think he's going to like the greens. He clearly knows how to play the golf course because he shot 10 under par 61 in, on Saturday and uh, got into a playoff with Austin Cook and Martin Laird last year. And he's one of these guys, 47th in the official world golf rankings, could do with some good results to make sure he stays in that top 50 for the 2022 Masters invite pre-Christmas. And I and I think of some of these players, I, I, don't, I don't know if Burns was one of those, I don't know if Danny Willett was one of those last week, who probably looks at the Ryder Cup and thinks to themselves, it's a kick up the bum, it's like I need to get myself back in the mix so that I'm going to make the President's Cup next year and I should be on these teams, not languishing as I am at the moment. I think Wolf can take that positively, potentially. Um, his one PGA to a title came in 2019 at TPC Twin Cities up in... Uh, they play that in Minnesota, don't they, I believe? The 3M Open. So, yeah, Wolf, 45-1. to 1. Of the top guys, is there anyone from that morass of players that either of you would back? I think statistically, Wolf was the only one who did catch my eye as well. Um, you know, you look at the strokes gain stats that we've published on the site, and he's he's all over those. Um, his record here was at 18th and second, and uh, yeah, I, he, he was where I my, my eye got drawn. I must say. Um, I've not particularly got anyone near the top. Are you anyone you fancy near the top there, Barry? <laughs> you asking me? No, I'm the wrong. Well, person. no, I know. Yeah, I know. The short odds, especially especially on a week where it just seems like a winner could come out of absolutely anywhere. Mm, yeah, you know, well, Barry. Yeah, done. let me back that up. Led was two twenty five to one last year. Mm. Nar seventy to one. Deschambeau fourteen to one. Cantlay twenty to one. It's feast or famine. Yeah, and, as you and say, anyone you, can win, man. <laughs> and when you're ba- when you're banking on one of the short, like say you're backing somebody under thirty to one, you're banking on them probably having to shoot sixty eight, sixty eight to just make the cut. Let's maybe say sixty eight, sixty nine to just make the cut. Um, you know, you're asking for a ripping fast start, so I, I'd rather hold my money back and maybe pick a couple of the fan, you know, the bigger names into the weekend once you see where they establish themselves and you, you might get maybe high teens on them if they're a couple off a few off the pace. Um so no, I haven't gone for the shorties to start. I've I've gone outside. Surprise, yeah. surprise. I think uh, the the one that caught my eye um, when I was just fishing through the stats yesterday was Will Zalatoris um in terms of tying in with the kind of style of play and having shot a mad low round last week. Um, was it was it sixty one? I think he shot. Was it? So, yeah, mm, yeah. Um, it can, oh, can my only, my only concern with Zalatoris is can he hit enough fairways? Because he he knocked the straightest off the tee. Yeah, yeah. Lots of greens. Lots of greens. Like last week, forty six point four percent green fairways. It twenty six of fifty six. He was fifty sixth of those that made the cut mm. for fairways. And I just don't. Yeah, place. Yeah, but to win. It doesn't follow the trend. Yeah. I mean, I'm saying that, and I put Matthew Wolf up, who's one of the <laughs> non strays But the one thing I will say is, when he's played here those two times, he seems to dial it back and knows the importance of hitting fairways. Yeah. So that that's that's the kind of lead. The ones the ones that the, you know, I'm, I was sitting here yesterday, just kind of spinning plates. Who do you go? I mean, answer twenty five to one. I mean, it's obvious. He's a WGC winner. He's got two fours here. If you if we, we've spoken about everything about this golf course, hitting fairways, tons of greens, not a great putter. Well, that's answer. You could argue Scotty Scheffler's going to have the week of his life. He hasn't won on the PGA Tour. This that those two and you know. He was unbeaten at the Ryder Cup. He beat John Rahm in singles. If there's anyone with momentum hitting here, it's Scotty Scheffler. And he's also had a top 10 at Felix. There's, there's, there's stuff you can throw at Scheffler. 
you could say Webb Web Simpson, you know, Mr. Magnolia, Barry would shoot me down in flames. And not that that put me off, but is there enough from Simpson recently to, it's just, I don't know. Kevin Nart, I don't back Nevin, Kevin Nart at 28 to 1. He wins at 50 to 1 and above. So it kind of took me to Matsu Army. You've got Louis Ustaz and he hasn't won in the States. You know, there's a myriad of different players there. So yeah, that I went down the route of it doesn't feel Patrick Reed like either, even at forty to one. That it doesn't I mean, if Reed was to win this, he'd have to go Kevin Nar nuts with a putter. That's how he would win it. So potentially. Um I've jumped off Siwoo Kim. That might come and bite me on the bum because he's playing some great stuff. I've also jumped off my old mate, um, Mito Barea. I expect he comes and probably wins because I've jumped off him, but don't know. Why did you jump off Mito? Good question. I haven't got an answer in. <laughs> I do think he's bent grass positive, Mito. Right I think that 66 to 1 that's ha- hanging there with Unibet is a great prize. I don't know. I, uh, yeah, I think probably it'd be a mistake. The other thing I do, you think about Mito, grew up in Chile, grew up around Santiago. Guess where that is? Well, that's at altitude. So I don't think the altitude is going to be an issue. He does hit lots of fairways and his tee to green game is miraculously good. I think what we saw last week was the fact that Mito again was top five for tee to green but clearly didn't get on with those Bermuda grass greens that particular week. So coming back to Bent, I mean, Paddy Power running scared of him. He's 40 to 1 with Paddy Power. And Uni better have him up at 66 to 1. Yeah. Boyle's going down at 35s. Yep. It's a big disparity so- there. I think I think Mito would be a good bet. That's probably going to come and bite me on the bum. The one I went with was Taylor Gooch, who I think's trending. He's a great approach player. Um, I think Gooch's weakness sometimes is the fact that he isn't the the longest off the tee and he isn't the straightest. So hopefully he can have a good driving week. His approach play is miraculous. Taylor Gooch is proper elite. I just think he's trending towards a win quite soon. And also, you look at Gooch. He's got a top four at PGA West where they play the American Express. He also had a top four here in Las Vegas, or a top five in Las Vegas last year where they played the CJ Cup. So I think he likes the clean air of the desert. I just think Gooch... I should have probably put Perea and Gooch up, but there you go. I've gone for Gooch, and then I went for one at a bigger price. And we've been mentioning him. I mentioned the one that caught my eye was when he was in the top five at the Northern Trust a while ago. And you think about the Northern Trust, that was effectively one of the, probably the strongest field of the whole year. Mm. Tom Hoagie, who, when you look at Hoagie, he has got a whole catalogue of desert results. On a golf course where you you know power off the tees and the gated, that's the kind of course where someone like a hoagie can come to the party. But he's finished tenth, fourth, and sixth at Montro Golf and Country Club, which is where they used to hold the Barracuda. He's finished sixth at PGA West. I was on him that week, three hundred to one, and seventh here at TPC Summerlin in twenty seventeen. He's also finished second at the twenty twenty Greenbrier, which, as we know, the Greenbrier over in West Virginia, that is also played at altitude on bent grass greens. He came second that year behind, I think it was Joaquin Neiman. Joaquin's only PGA Tour victory. So yeah, Tom Hoagie, 150 to 1 I got on him, eight places each way with Ladbrokes. But yeah, so Hoagie, Taylor Gooch, Matthew Wolf, and Hideki Matsuwa, what could go wrong? Those are my four. And I'm regretting not putting up Mito Pereira. Oh, there's still time, Stephen. Just, just for the listeners, Stephen. I think Paul was, Paul was going, where's your, where's, you need to get this out. You need, and, I was like, oh, and in the end, I was split, split. And this is it. It's, it's difficult to be, it's difficult to know who to back, <laughs> to be honest, because it's one of those. It's just, mm. you could, you could tip up 40 players this week. From five hundred to one and in, 
I can't Don't believe you're it. blaming Paul. I can't believe you're blaming Paul <laughs> yeah. for not book, not picking Mito. Yeah, I mean, just get on to Odds Checker, grab the best combo of you know places and price, and just back him because you know you're going to regret not doing it. At least, you, at least you've avoided FOMO for the rest of the week. So, He's sixty you know, to one with Bet Fred right now, eight places each way. Do you know what? I might have to write a paragraph and just add him to my tips because otherwise, Emo- uh, yeah. if, he, if he wins this, he's going to break my heart. That's an emotional insurance bet. <laughs> I, I've gone for I've gone for a couple of outsiders um, quickly because we do need to talk about Spain. Um, yeah. I've backed pa- Pat Perez uh, back to Vegas. Listen, yeah. Pat's boom or bust when it comes to uh, to this event. So uh, I'm going for the boom week. Uh, that's he's had a third and a seventh here, um, miscut yeah. last year, but third and a seventh his previous two outings. Uh, he had a miscut a couple of weeks ago, but before that was playing some more right golf. So yeah, whatever. Um, the other one then is Matthew Neesmith, who has a, oh, where is it? An 18th and an 8th here, but absolutely zero incoming form. Uh, miscut, 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 51st miscut. So let's hope he's this week's Danny Willett. Yeah. And I, ba- and I backed Ricky as well because I can't not back Ricky. What price is Ricky? I don't know. That's a genuine a hundred, question. Uh, 100 to 1. Oh, wow. That's a good price. It is a good price on a player who's got... Uh, yeah. I oh, he's a winner. Where, where's he win. won? Uh, he won at Phoenix. Mm. Mm. What about you, Paul? Yeah, very nice. You must have gone for Pat Perez because you no, love Pat Perez in a birdie fest. No, no, no. I, I've only backed two, actually. Um, I've backed Ryan Moore, and he fits that uh, ball striker profile. He's a sort of team know, part, definitely. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you some stats in a second, which, uh, which might, <laughs> <laughs> might open your eyes. Team um, know part, Ryan Moore. He, uh, well, he won in um, 2012. He, he's been 7th, 9th, 15th, 19th. Here. Do you know the, the number that got me? When he won here in 2012, he led putting average. He was first for putting average. When he was 15th in 2016, he was 8th putting average. He was 4th for strokes game putting because they were measuring it back then. When he was 13th in 2019, he was 4th for putting average here. He was 12th for strokes game putting. He likes these greens. He may not like any other greens in the in the whole of the world, but he likes the greens here. Yeah. And, we all, yeah. Ryan Moore is just bent grass monster in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bent yeah, grass, but, no good. Yeah, bent well, grass, no Going back to your preview, he's got three wins in, on Bent. So, um, yeah, I think he ranks fourth or fifth in your your list of Bent Grass winners in the field yeah. um, over 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 time. So, so that's that kind of gets him a tick there. He was second at the John Deere Classic recently. Another one of these par seventy one resort courses, Bent Grass greens. It all kind of adds up there. Um, four missed cuts after that, which kind of explains his price down there at 150 to one. But he was 13th, uh, sorry, 39th last week, which was much, much better. 16th for strokes gained approach. And now that he lands on a course where he loves the bent grass greens and uh, can, can putt absolutely lights out while hitting, <laughs> while, while, <laughs> while hitting every single fairway and his approach game is trending. He's a what bargain. could possibly go wrong? Absolutely. He's an absolute bargain at 150s. Uh, yeah, so uh, Ryan Moore's in. I've also backed Jim Herman, who we mentioned a few moments ago. Um, and he's, again, if you look at his raw stats, don't look at strokes gained with Jim because he's not really get, gaining that many strokes. If you look at his raw stats in terms of driving accuracy, over his last seven starts, he's ranked fourth, eighth, fourth, seventh, 31st, Mr. Cut, and then first for driving accuracy last time out of the 40 net. He's hitting fairways for fun. Um, he's hitting some decent numbers of greens as well. He's just not making or not, not gaining the strokes, um, across the whole board that's allowing him to get into, uh, really contending positions. But he's made five, sorry, six of the last seven cuts he's made, uh, which is a revelation for Jim. And he's long overdue a win. I mean, he tends to win every 20, 25 events. So this is his 25th event. I've just counted up since his last win. He's absolutely ripe. I'm sorry, 500 to one he is out there, Jim. He's at the right right price point. Um, his game in terms of um, off the tee is absolutely spot on for this. Um, he's finished top twenty here in the past, which is uh, neither here nor there. But uh, at least he's got some positive uh, history on this track, and um, I think he'll tear the place up at five hundred to one. 
I, I see no reason not to not to back him. So so he's in. Herman's in. Ryan Moore's in, and I do really like your Matthew Wolf shout. I think uh, I think Wolf could go particularly well this week. Open to Spania. Mm. Indeed, the Spanish Open. Actually, we're heading to uh, Spain for the start of uh, a three-week stint over there. Since we've had a little bit of a rejig with the uh, with the uh, schedule, as uh, as we've seen over the last year or two, it's uh, it's all pretty fluid. But we've got the um, the Open to Spania in Madrid this week. We've got Valderrama next week. Valderrama Field. I was mentioning to you guys off mic, which. Um, let me just grab my sheet that's got the list of some of the names on there. But but next week we've got uh, John Rahm, Martin Keimer, Matt Fitzpatrick's coming over, um, Aaron Rye's coming over as well, Bernd Wiesberger's staying on in Spain, Rafa Cabrera Bayo, Christian Bezweden, who's playing, Andy Sullivan. There's mm-hmm. loads of um, kind of decent level players playing at uh, Valderrama next week and a strong undercard as well. It's going to be a really good event um, mm-hmm. over there. Um, next week and then after that we've got uh, Mallorca uh, we're playing on the island of Mallorca the following week as well so we've got three decent events over in Spain um, this week though it's, it's a bit of a bit of a top heavy one we've got John Rahm top of the uh, top of the market only player in the top 50 at the moment nine to four favorite being backed in he may well go off at two to one across the board um, which we haven't seen really since the likes of uh, when when Tiger Woods was um, well. And he, he, Woods used to go off shorter than that, but even so, two to one um, is a short, short, short favourite for a full field golf event. Bernd Wiesberg, eighteen to one, is the second favourite. Then we're into the likes of Callum Hill, Victor Perez at thirty fives, Guido at fifty five. Uh, sorry, thirty fives. Masahiro Kawamura has been backed in at 45's best price, 50 to 1 bar. So uh, by the time you get to the seventh player in the field, you're already up to 50 to 1. Such is the dominance of John Rahm at the top of the, uh, top of the market. Um, where are we? We're playing the Club de Campo Via de Madrid. Um, it's a 7,112 yard par 71. It's a resort course, tree lined, but it's not claustrophobically so. It's not Valderrama. Um, smallly spent power greens. Um, they lengthened it a bit, uh, before they played here in 2019 when, uh, when John Rahm won. Rahm still shot 22 under, even though they'd uh, attempted to make it a little bit trickier. Um, and it needs a bit of weather really to protect it. And we're not going to get that this week. 25 degrees centigrade, some mid 70s Fahrenheit, virtually no wind. I was look, I was looking on Windfinder um, when I was doing my prep work for this, and one of the days had winds of one mile an hour. I mean, seriously, these guys are going to absolutely rip um, the course to shreds. I think we do have some older form here, and um, from pr- prior to the renovation in 2019, we've got the Spanish Open was played here five times during the 90s. Um, slightly more recently, we've got the Open Madrid and the Madrid Masters. They were played between 2000 to 2005. And then again, the last time before its renovation was 2008. And then, of course, we've got the um, event from the last time we played this Spanish Open in 2019. It does hop about this event. So I'll, I'll, go, I'll give you an, an idea, a, a flavour of who's won um, this event. But bear in mind, they've been on very different courses um, many times it's, it hops about a lot and uh, a lot of the courses don't bear much resemblance to the others so we've got um, 2010 Alvo Quiros won at 18 to 1 uh, 2011 was Thomas Aiken of 45s Francesca Molinari won at 16 to 1 in 2012 Raphael Jacqueline won at 55 to 1 in 2013 I remember that was a tough coastal track I think that was the one where he won on about the 10th playoff hole um, after an absolute marathon. 2014 was Miguel Angel Jimenez, won at 22 to 1. James Morrison was 225 to 1 when he won in 2015. Um, Andrew Beef Johnston, 100 to 1. He won at Valderrama to, to get, again, to give you an idea of the different style of tracks that have been used. He was 100 to 1 in 2016 when he won. Uh, 2018 was John Rahm at 4 to 1. And then John Rahm backed that up. He defended successfully in 2019 at 100 to 30. 
um, two years ago. So you've got four to one, 100 to 30, nine to four best price at the moment and verging in on 11 to five, maybe two to one by the time we go on Thursday for John Rahm to make it a, uh, a hat trick of open De Spagna titles over the last three starts. Um, I guess if you look through the stats, we do have some extensive stats in 2019. We've got strokes gain. We've also got the regular um, traditional stats as well. I mean, Ryan absolutely battered the field. So his stats stand out quite uh, quite starkly against everyone else. He was a five straight winner. Um, he was third for fairways that week, 12th for greens and regulation, third for scrambling, first for putting and old money. If you look at strokes gained, he was first for strokes gained off the tee, first for strokes gained tee to green. So he made, or most of the damage was done from his um, long game uh, off the tee and his tee to green performance. Um, and perhaps that's a better point, really. If you look at second place, Rafa Cabrera Bayo, he was second for strokes gained tee to green. So the first two home were first and second for strokes gained tee to green. He was also seventh for strokes gained off the tee. So I think you're going to find, and maybe not overly dissimilar to the style that uh, you were talking about on um, over at the Shriners, Steve, it could well be that a strong long game performance, a strong um, tee to green performance in terms, yeah. of, in terms of strokes gained really is what uh, sets up these birdie and eagle opportunities. So we're looking for ball strikers in both events. That's what we're kind of saying, unless it's Kevin Nahr in, in Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can you can have outliers in these things, aren't you? Because if you're talking yeah. about a resort track where twenty under wins, you can get someone who goes absolutely bananas with a putter, and you know if they're gaining ten, twelve shots with the putter over the course of four days, you know it doesn't take a great deal with the rest of the game to get themselves into the contender position. But I, you know, I would suggest when we look back on both the leaderboards on Sunday night, then maybe six or seven of the top ten on both will be more towards the style of player that we've kind of uh, suggested would be the better option for this week. We shall see. Um, Form wise, looking back, I mean, there's ten the ten winners I've just read through, or all the winners since 2010 at least. Each one of them had a top ten finish in their last ten starts, so a little bit of incoming form is fine. John Ryan had actually missed the cut of the Daniel Lynx on his previous start um, before winning in 2019. Prior to that, his um, previous 13 oh, nine starts, his worst was uh, the worst finish was 13th. He won the Irish Open. He was in a really rich vein of form. So um, I think you've got to assume that some decent incoming form is the order of the day here. And birdies and eagles, that is where we need to be um, where we need to be going this week. I think keep your card as clean as possible. Attack the scoring holes, make lots of birdies, get yourself up towards that kind of 20 under or beyond number, I think, is going to be where they are this week. Unless we get an absolute curveball thrown at us and we find that they've grown the rough to something astronomical um, in the meantime, but um, there's no indication that that's going to be the case. And With no wind and placid conditions and nice sunny weather, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be quite a low scorer. Difficult to know how to play this one, isn't it? Because you've got a player at the top. I've, I've not seen any of the um, previews that I've read from other other people out there so far this week. I've not seen anyone dare stick John Rahm up at nine to four. Um, I suppose some someone might at some point and just go, yeah, you know, put all of their um, all of their pennies on John Rahm for one week. Which yeah, you could do, I suppose, couldn't you? you, you are you suggesting Steve Palmer doesn't put him up at nine to four? Of course, I'm, 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 I'll, I'll be interested to see how Steve plays it because um, you know he'll, he'll look at the raw numbers. So, no, he put Sam Burns up at sixteen to one last he week, and I was prize proud. Yeah. And guess what happened? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He could have had a monster double with Lagergren. So, but yeah, I, it's it's difficult because you you could make a very 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 strong case and say, well, John Rahm, where well, he's won the last two Spanish Opens, is the world number one. Um, he's won six of 16 um, career regular tour events on the European tour. I mean, six of 16, the price is justified on that ratio alone. You, you don't need to go much further than that. He's head and shoulders above everyone else in the field. If you're trying to build a case against him, if he's won six out of 16, that means he's been beaten 10 out of the 16 times. So he's not infallible. Um he can be beaten if someone goes out there and, and absolutely, you know, shoots lights out, which uh, which can happen, particularly on a resort course. 
uh, he's coming off a missed cut. Now, if you look, go back through his history, he's missed the cut prior to last week, or uh, last time at the 40 net. He's missed the cut 16 times. He's only won once um, on his subsequent start from those 16 um, missed cuts. Um, the fly in the ornament, <laughs> that, that's uh, angle of attack is that that one win was here. So um, he does, does have some uh, some previous of going missed cut win on this particular track. But uh, let's let's work with that. You've also got the Ryder Cup. I mean, you, you, we need to consider it, I think. He single-handedly carried Team Europe for large parts of those three days. Um, and despite his own performance, he's got to have been disappointed with the output or the outcome of that, uh, of those three days of the, of the Ryder Cup itself and the, you know, almost humiliating result that, uh, that, that ensued. So has that taken, uh, taken an effect? We'll have to see, see how he, see how he comes out. After the last Ryder Cup in 2018, he didn't play for a month after that. He skipped the Spanish Open that time. When he re-emerged, he finished 22nd on his next start at the WGC HSBC Champions. He was fourth on the Earth course, which he loves. The, he loves the Earth course. He was fourth on his following start after that. So he didn't particularly hit the ground running immediately after um, the Ryder Cup in 2018. Three years long, I know. Um, he was the best player on Team Europe. I understand that. Um Disappointment is the other side of it. I don't know. As, you know, we're kind of clutching at straws, I guess, trying to build a, build a tentative or very flimsy case against him. But um, I, you know, for me, if he wins at nine, the four, and so be it. Um, but he's got to be on it from the very start here. If he goes out and shoots one or two under or worse on the first round, I think he could be a long way off the lead. And you know, at that point, do you you know do, do you start to see a, um, a frustrated John who's not not catching up and making the birdies as quickly as he reasonably can. If he goes off to an absolute flyer, shoots 62 in the first round, you're not going to see him for dust, I don't think. And, uh, you know, you, you could be then looking, or you should be looking at markets where you're um, trying, you know, wire-to-wire -wire winning markets potentially, or, um, you know, shots won by markets. Potentially also looking at playing the without Ra markets. There weren't any up when I was uh, when I was doing my preview yesterday. They've started to emerge now, so well worth a look if you um, have a fancy but want to play without without Ram. There are some some bookies that have gone out there without Ram and without Deesberger as well. So you potentially take the top two out of the market and and have a completely separate um, betting heat for this particular week. Um. I've, I, I, I went around the houses with this and I, in the end I decided just, just to go with three each way shots who could on their day compete and contend against John Rahm if um, everything goes their way. Um, and I leave it at that. I, I didn't really want to go with a, a full staking plan on this because, um, it, if John Rahm wins, then it could be, you know, it, it could be a painful, painful week. So I've just gone with three. I've gone at the top with Nikolai Hogard at 50 to one. And if we're talking about the Ryder Cup, it was where a second ago, talking about 2023, I expect we'll see a Hogard or potentially two there in a couple of years time. Uh, Rasmus is out in the States this week. He's playing over in your event, Steve. Um, yeah. Is yeah. Which I've looked at the prices with him. They're really quite divided about how how he'll fare as well. So uh, interesting to see how he goes. Nikolai though is on the road to catching him up after his win at the Italian Open a few weeks ago. Um, he followed that up with a twentieth at the BMW PGA Championship, fourteenth at the Daniel Links on debut, which was pretty impressive last week. He is tenth for strokes gained tee to green for the season to date. And when he was winning in Italy a couple of, well, last month, um, he was first for uh, strokes going off the tee. He was strokes, uh, first for strokes going tee to green as well. That marries in perfectly with how Rahm and Cabrera Bayo got, um, into first and second positions, um, uh, when they, uh, when they played here a couple of years ago. Uh, ultimately, I think the potential of Nikolai Hogard is huge. Um, I think 50 to 1, given that if he gets in the position, he could be the kind of player who's got that uh, youthful exuberance to go out and um, and, and really give uh, give Rama, Rama run for his money. So um, I've, I've taken a chance on him. I've also taken a chance on Alexander Levy. Alexander Levy, 80 to 1. Um, we've got our young buck in the team, perhaps adding someone like Levy with his swashbuckling style, um, could also push John Rahm all the way. 
um, by the end of Sunday. He loves these scoreable f- flat tracks, doesn't he, Levy? That's that's his game. He's, um, his first four wins, he shot a 63 or better in each of his first four wins on tour. 62, 61s, he was all over those um, those wins. And when there's a score to be made, he's absolutely in his element. He's fit and healthy again after some back issues and he's swinging at full speed again. I love watching his um, swings when he's uh, when he's absolutely hammering that ball off the tee. He's, uh, it's a joy to watch. And he plays with a, a lovely smile on his face as well. Very amiable character, Alex Levy. Um, four consecutive events now of strokes gained positive in all of his long game measures, which is good. He was second at the kazoo. He shot a 66-64 to finish runner up to Callum Hill. That was his best finish since 2018. And he was also 15th here last time out in 2019. Um, that came after four straight missed cuts. Um, and then he, he finished 15th here. So a massive improvement would suggest that this track here suits his eye. And although he missed the cut last week at Carnoustie, no, no issue there. I don't, you know, John Rahm and Bayo both lost or missed the cuts um, at uh, the Dunhill Links before finishing first and second last time he came here. He did shoot five under at Carnoustie on the first day before the wind picked up. And, and that, again, suggests to me that uh, Alex Levy is in some decent form. So Levy's in at 80-1. to 1. And finally, I've added a splash of um, the enigmatic style of um, uh, Alvaro Quiros to my team as well at 250 to 1. Um, you know, you go back in the, the days, back, um, you know, 2006 through 2011, he was a top 25 golfer. He was right at the top of his game, Alvaro Quiros. He won six times in his 20s before it all dried up. Not much since. He won the 2017 Rocco Forte Open to remind us that he's still capable. There's a couple of second and third place finishes, but lots and lots and lots of missed cuts. There's, again, another one of these players who is quite difficult to call. But if you look at the, the track here, if you look at the um, players who played well in 2019 and going back prior to that as well, there's some decent crossover with Kiros. Uh, John Rahm, um, we've talked about ad nauseum, he He's won twice at the Earth Course. Alvaro Quiros has won at the Earth Course back when it was the Dubai World Championship back uh, 2011, I think he won that. Um, Rafa Cabrera Bayo has won the Dubai Desert Classic, as has Alvaro. Charles Schwartzel, um, who won here in 2008 pre the renovations, he is a Leopard Creek um, master. He's won there multiple times. Alvaro Quiros got his first. European Tour win at Leopard Creek and also some of the other players in the top 10 from both of those leaderboards cross over in terms of their uh, performances and the, the tracks that they've played particularly well on with Kiros as well. He does have some form here, fourth in 2008, he opened with a 74 then shot 66, 66, 64, finished fourth, went on to win at Villamora the next week. Um, and again, Villamora, I think Barry mentioned this to me off mic, is another one of the tracks which fits in very nicely with some of the players who perform well here. Um, a few handy positions recently, 27th at the Dunhill Links last week. That was his best effort over there on the Fife Coast for over a decade. And I think he could be the kind of player that could just pop up and really get uh, into the mix at a, a, a mad price, 250 to 1. So just just the three. Kiros 250s, Levy 80 to 1, and Nikolai Hogard at 50 to 1. Any fancy from you, Barry? Um, I'm sticking with Kawamura. He's going he's gonna to do it at some stage. Maybe it's this week, maybe it's not, but um, it's quite a nice price for him considering um, Ram is there in the field. So I'll, t- I'll, I'll have a go with Kawamura and. Mm. Who's the other one? Sorry, Jeff Winter uh, was fourth here last year, 14th last week, and I was able to snag him at 80 to 1, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took, took the extra places. Yeah. Yeah, he's a capable player, Winter. We shall see. What about you, Steve? Any Anyone catch your eye? No idea. <laughs> no idea. No idea whatsoever. You're not, you're not, you're not push, pushing all the pennies in on John Rahm. <clears throat> Do I remember him winning his first Open to Spaniard at three to one? 
it's yeah, four to one. It was the first one, and four then hundred hundred to thirty mm. his second time. So yeah, his, his price is uh, rapidly going down. If he wins this one, it'd be going off about five to four next year. I have followed a friend's shout just while Steve is percolating there, um, just to sort of get. Uh, combo- just to get Ram into the betting this week. So uh, he doubled Ram with Harrington, um, who's playing in the Constellation, Furyk and Friends. Yeah, that's so right, yeah. I've, I've, I've gone and taken on that double. Um, yeah. So that gets, that gets well, me Ram on board. Paddy in the kind of 25, 28 to one bracket. Tw- like 25s, yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. Interesting to see how he goes. It's an option, yeah. It's a good option, actually, it, isn't it? It's amazing how many guys, like, hit the champions tour for their you know one of their first starts and just grab a win mm-hmm. it's yeah. like the the freedom is there they're like oh this is easy now and then bang yeah yeah I could see that I'm still manning over Mito Pereira <laughs> would you just back him Steve I'll loan you a tenner I'll give you a tenner to put the bet on <laughs> cheeky five reach way and then your head I'm, is I'm still I'm still manning Mito why don't you? Why don't you leave it until uh, late in the day on uh, on Thursday when the best prices are out on the exchange and uh, and, and just uh, just put a few quid on to satisfy your curiosity. He was just fourth in Mexico, and th- I think second in Colombia at high altitude on one of the corn ferry years he did. So clearly, altitude is not an issue. Steve, I've backed him just there, just just to. <laughs> You backed him. I'll I'll sell you. I'll sell you my bet. <laughs> We've been doing this for too long. We know the pitfalls, but we still fall into them year after year. It's emotional insurance bet. So you just yeah, even if it, so. even if it loses, you don't have the torture for the week. And I think that's worth a couple of euro. So, mm. and I've backed Mido a couple of times recently. So I'm I'm I mean I'm way less of a candidate for this than you are. Second for greens in regulation this year. 34th for driving accuracy. Second for ball striking. Steve, what are you doing? Mm. I know. (laughs) Right. I think that's us, chaps. Yep. I think that is us. I I hope you have another good week with your bets, Paul, and to you, Barry. Yeah, best of luck, guys. I hope the listeners have a great week and we will be back next week for the Valderrama tournament on the, uh, that is the, it's my favourite beer actually, my favourite lager, the Estrella Masters in it or something. Yeah, yeah, and the Lithium. And, yeah, and the, and the CJ Cup in, on the PJ Tour. Um, don't forget five star reviews. Very, very important for us. And uh, we'll see you next week. Goodbye. If you like betting on God. But everyone that you back misses the cut Get some experts involved With all the stats and the tips and so much more Cause it's the golf betting system The golf betting system is the golf